Oh, set to go? Good. Good. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. You are, look at the weather, you are the bravest Christians in the world. You are just so brave, braving this, this snowstorm that's here. Welcome to St. Mary Ann's Episcopal Church. It's a blessing to be here today. To, it, it's, it's a blessing to be live on YouTube. It's a blessing to see live people in the sanctuary. I've missed, uh, I've missed all of you. And uh, we've got a beautiful service uh, planned today. We have uh, our director of music, Joel Alarcon, and his wife, Ray, who will be leading us in our music. Uh, you've got your bulletin. Our readings are in here. Drew Torgrosso will be leading us in our readings and in our prayers. And our service will begin with our uh, opening hymn today, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Please stand. Our service of Holy Eucharist this morning will be found in your uh, folder, service bulletin on page three. We'll begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. From you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's pray together our contemporary collect. It's found in your insert. We'll say this together. Almighty and everlasting God, 
You govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who, will, who shall speak to them everything I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 111. Let us say the psalm responsibly by full verse. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. 
For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then there was a in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Before I became a priest, and I have not been a priest forever, contrary to opinion, uh, I, I always enjoyed hearing this sermon in the different churches that Karen and I and our family worshiped in. I used to call it the meat sermon. Uh, because I'm talking about 1 Corinthians in this passage in chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. It's about meat, so, uh, so not to offend the vegans and uh, vegetarians in the crowd. But it's not about meat, it's about Christian freedom. Those of us who have been Bible readers and Christians for any length of time should have no trouble imagining what was happening in the Corinthian church. There were folks who were claiming rights based on a deeper understanding of a spiritual knowledge that they had. They called it gnosis, this gnosis, a Greek word for knowledge, which was the in word for these Corinthian Christians. They were disinclined to put up with the scruples of those who didn't appreciate their freedom in Christ to do certain things. See, Paul here is helping the Corinthians navigate some ongoing tensions in this passage. Someone a little earlier had asked Paul a question, is it okay for Christians to eat meat that has previously been sacrificed to pagan idols. For some new Christians, eating meat that had been sacrificed to an idol would have been difficult. As is so often the case, other motivations were subtly mixed in beneath the surface. 
that was probably thought important by some Corinthian Christians to attend banquets offered in the temple. Maybe their clients or perhaps business partners were inviting them into these pagan temples. They couldn't afford to refuse. What's more, an invitation to attend many of these banquets may well have been something of a status symbol. So they resented even more the Christians in the church who were complaining about their participation. They were increasingly exasperated that, that they couldn't make these simple-minded believers understand. Now, we know food is not an issue for Christians. Eating meat doesn't make you any more or less a follower of Christ. Idols are not real things, after all, and Christians shouldn't behave as if we believe that they were. Others, however, could not get past the associations with the pagan temples inevitably had in their minds. And so a situation was created that we all know too well from our own experiences. We think in our own time of issues that have so disturbed the peace of the church and the consciousness of Christians. But we also have similar problems over this gnosis, this higher knowledge. I know things that this particular group or denomination or church doesn't know, and therefore I'm better. I'm better at this. I know all of this. It saddens me to say that this was demonstrated in Corinth, has been demonstrated many times throughout our history, since some Christian people can be mean and bitter and unloving towards one another. Often the selfish disregard for others and opinions stems from our sense that we know more than they know. And so what is to be the purest friendship and family in the world is the Christian church ends up a society of squabblers and looking daggers at, at one another. And God forgive us if that happens. Well, St. Paul would have none of that. Knowledge is not the issue, he says, but love. He says in this way, you are so proud of your knowledge, but instead of building up others with your knowledge, you're tearing them down. Your knowledge has led to elitism, to pride, not the humble, self-sacrificial service of others that Christ exemplified and taught us. So that before Paul even takes up these ethical issues raised by this division in the church, he wants to get something clear, and that is that love builds up. Christians know that they are to love one another. Jesus said that. He said it a number of times. He said it repeatedly, emphatically. He said we're to love one another as he loved us. Paul gives the Corinthians and us a basic template for answering this question. Put others first. Let our conscience be guided by whatever is best for your brother and sister in Christ. Throughout 1 Corinthians, Paul makes this point that we're to act in love, we're to care for others, we're to live in freedom of Christ that allows us to put others first. But, says Paul, you cannot claim to be loving your brother or sister if you're tearing them down, if you're weakening they're resolved to live a godly life. No true knowledge would ever lead a Christian to make choices that are to a real detriment of his or her fellow Christians. So Paul says the failure in Corinth was not a theological failure. It was not a failure to properly resolve and settle the ethical question of eating meat offered to idols at banquets in the pagan temple or meals taken at home. Paul doesn't begin with that. In chapter 8 here, he makes no effort whatsoever to change the minds of those who are thinking incorrectly about the ethics of eating with unbelievers in unbelieving settings. Paul begins at another place. He's as much as saying, look, this problem you're having about eating meat offered to idols and eating in the temples, he said, don't fool yourselves. That's not your real problem. If this disagreement were to disappear, another would rise in its place. If it weren't about the meals in the temples, it would be something else. Your problem is a severe and inexcusable lack of love and consideration for one another. The, the dispute you're having, he says, is about who is free to do whatever is just a mask behind which you hide proud and selfish spirits. What you need, what the church needs, is less of this gnosis, this special knowledge, and more love. And what is love, and how would it act when believers do not see eye to eye? We don't all agree on everything. But love understands. Love sympathizes. It's interesting and an important fact that Paul actually agrees in some substantial measure with the bad guys in the Corinthian church. He admits that 
As to some of the important principles involved, the proud and the haughty were right, and the tender in conscience were wrong. It was not wrong for Christians to eat meat sacrificed to idols, but later in chapter 10, <clears throat> he'll say that it is entirely acceptable to have a meal at home and eat such meat, even to eat with others. An idol is nothing, he says. It isn't as if the meat was sacrificed to idols, that there was actually some God receiving this sacrifice. What's more, Jesus said, food is only, only for the body. It's not what goes into a person, he says, that defiles him or her. It's what comes out of them. It is by faith in the heart, not by taking meat into the stomach that draws one near to God. Food in and of itself will neither bring us closer to God or drive us further from him. But Paul says everyone in the church is not fully aware of this. That's understandable, of course. See, we have new believers here. These are people who are pagan, who are slowly coming to Christ. Difficult sometimes to give up your old ways. They're still steeped in the culture of idolatry, but they're being drawn towards Christ. And these people find it difficult to count an idol as nothing. They're finding difficult having worshipped idols themselves all of their lives. They find it difficult to count that these pagan rituals are nothing. Remember as they do how powerfully they were swept into them in the early days of their unbelief. They find it understandably difficult to count the whole question insignificant when no doubt they had many friends and perhaps loved ones who were still pagan idol worshipers. We might think today of a person whose family might be destroyed by an alcoholic in their family, finding the fellow, fellow Christians, their fellow Christians, they drink beer and they drink wine. They're doing this. Wait a minute. I thought we weren't supposed to do that. Or a person who vowed never to have anything to do with divorce, seeing her parents divorce, learning that the church permits divorces. It's like, what's going on here? You can see how new believers can get different, different messages. Surely you can understand, says Paul, how difficult it will be for someone who has just stepped out of that world, just been liberated from that bondage to do what seems to be to him or her to be going back into a world and participating in it. Jesus sympathizes with our weakness, with our incredible slowness in getting things right, with our spiritual stupidity that requires him to teach us the same things over and over again, with our dullness of heart. Can't we now have a similar sympathy for those who are slow to understand in their new situation? That's Paul's argument. What do we do for this new believer? In the second place, love would not only understand, it would take an interest. How is your brother or sister growing in grace and knowledge of Christ? How is he or she overcoming their temptations and fighting the good fight of faith? ought to be a matter of deep interest to us. And that was the Corinthians' failure to care for one another at their point of greatest concern, their walk with God, their purity and obedience of their lives. Did you ever ask somebody, how's your prayer life? How's your walk with God? How's your spiritual life? How are you doing with all of this? And then listen this is what Christ is concerned about in all of us. And when we show unconcern for our brother or sister's holiness of life, we sin against Christ himself. It's the blunt language Paul uses in verse 12 here. He says, but when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Ouch. You act against the best interests of our fellow Christians, faith and life, or undermining Christ's own interests in their lives. We can't love Christ if we despise or actively or passively those whom he loves. We recognize this immediately in other relationship. No husband who loves his wife will despise his in-laws, however difficult it may be for him to appreciate them. He loves his wife, and for her sake he must love and will love all that she loves. So with Christ and those he loves, and those for whom he laid down his life. That carries more weight with us, doesn't it? It is one thing to fail to love a brother or sister in Christ. It's another to be told that in that failure, we fail to love our Savior as well. We didn't intend that. The Corinthians didn't imagine that they were doing that. But then there's this third thing. 
Not only does love understand and sympathize, not only does love take an immediate interest in the welfare of another, it also makes sacrifices on behalf of that welfare. It's not enough, says Paul, <clears throat> to understand why others may think and behave as they do in ways different than your own and according to the principles you don't share. It's not even enough to take a spiritual interest in the lives in their godliness. Love, Christian love, requires that we take whatever steps, as difficult as they may be, and often they will be, the steps required to help them on to God. And so Paul says right there in verse 13, Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. What is that but a pure, small imitation of love for us that sent Christ into the world and then sent him to the cross. Love measured in the Bible as it is measured in life is measured by the price that is paid by the lover. Our love for one another is measured in the same way. It's measured, authenticated, proved by what we're willing to sacrifice on its behalf. And we offer that reason to stop pretending that we're loving others when we're doing nothing, and it costs us nothing. This is a passage of Scripture intended by the Holy Spirit to make us think, really think long and hard about our lives, to examine ourselves, to hold up our thoughts, our words, and deeds to the light of truth. If we took our church directory as if it were a Bible and we meditated upon it, we'd ask ourselves if our attitudes and action in and towards others, specifically within this congregation, this church family, constitute this kind of love. This self-sacrificing interest, as Paul exemplifies in this thrilling promise in verse 13. There's something always heroic in a true Christian life. There ought to be something heroic in your life and in my life. People ought to be forced from time to time to wonder why we do what they, we do. Why do these Christians, why do these people at St. Marian's do what they do? Why do they make the choices that they make? We try to live in a different way treat others differently. And they ought finally to be driven to conclude that the love of Christ is in us. It constrains us to do these things. Seeing that we treat other people so generously, so willing to make sacrifices for them because we are animated and controlled by this great love of Christ, we believe that we have been loved greatly, so we return love. Loved ones, look up to Jesus Christ on his throne. Look then back to the cross and forward to heaven. Look around at one another and then listen with all your heart as our Lord and Savior tells us once more, as I have loved you, so love one another. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen. We'll continue on in our service. As we stand, we'll say the Nicene Creed and affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this town of Northeast, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good, for the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for the sick and suffering, especially for Kathy Boyd, Peter and Stephanie Maris, Steve Naughton, Gertrude Smith, Alicia Walker and family, and for Becky Diaz, pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer due to the COVID virus, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, especially Ellen Diaz and Florel Diaz. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to the Christ, to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord our God. Lord, hear the prayers of thy people and what we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. Good to see you. Please be seated.
Well, just uh, uh, a couple of an announcements here. Uh, and, and welcome to those people who are online. Right? We're, we're doing okay with our, with our stream. Welcome to, uh, to all of you. Uh, yesterday we had our annual meeting of uh, St. Mary Ann's uh, parish meeting, and that was uh, on Zoom, and we had some people in the parish house. If you were unable to attend or if you did not get the annual meeting uh, reports, there's a little uh, uh, box right outside the church door and there are extra copies of the reports in there, so you're welcome to take them, uh, them home. You're welcome to go up and down Main Street and pass them out, uh, what, what, whatever, you, whatever you prefer. So we, we, hope, uh, we, we hope that, uh, that, that you take a look at the reports, specifically uh, not only our financial situation, which in, in, in we're, we're in, in blessings to all of you that, that we're in good shape as we enter 2021, but look at the year in review. Look at what we have done and during this shut down, put down, locked up, masked up, you know, all kinds of things. So we're, uh, we're, we, we continue to do God's work, uh, even in this situation, and we will continue to do so. So I thank everyone who's, who's helped with that meeting, from Valerie in our office to my wife Karen, Andrea and, and Drew and Rick and Donnie. Everybody's helped in so many ways with outreach and, and mission. It's, it's just such a blessing. You may get an email, uh, or even some may get a phone call from Valerie in our office. We're checking on things because we're going to be updating our directory. If there's been an email address change or, or uh, a, a street address change, any of those kinds of things, we, we want to keep the directory current and up to date. We, we realized when we were looking at birthdays that not everyone was born 1-1-1980. We have a lot of people who were born January 1st, 1980, for some reason. So uh, if you weren't born on 1-1-1980, you may get let, let us know, please. Uh, uh, you're welcome to just call the office, say, do you have my correct date of birth? Do you have my correct email address? Uh, and, and again, we, we don't share any of this information. It, it's just kept, uh, kept uh, with, with, within the church. I had my first vaccine shot, uh, and I was a true baby. Uh, with it, most most men are babies with with some of this stuff, right? The needle was this big; it took four people to shove it into my arm. It actually went through the other side. It came out this side, and they refused refused to give me a lollipop. Uh, it was just terrible. It was just terrible. So it was okay. I was. I'm just, is he really? Did he mean it? No, he didn't mean it. So they did give me a sticker though. So I wore my sticker proudly. So very excited about that. So if you have the opportunity. Uh, to, uh, to, to get your vaccine. Uh, if, if you're so able to, we, we encourage you to do so. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries here today? Nary a one, okay. Our um, virtual choir piece is not the piece listed in here. It is what, Hoel? When we all get to, when we all get to heaven is our virtual choir piece led by our, our choir director, Alex B., and, and some of our choir members who are actually here today. So, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice for God.
If you have a gluten sensitivity, we offer gluten-free communion hosts. Okay. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people. In your words spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ. And bring us to that heavenly country, where with St. Paul and the Blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. 
Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. We offer a prayer of spiritual communion for those attending our online service. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament since I cannot at this time receive communion. I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you. I embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Find the body of Christ that was broken for you. John, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. John, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Judy, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Father Sam, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Carol, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. John, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I got the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I'm the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I'm the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Bart, the body of Christ that was broken for you. Drew, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Frank, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Pat, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Dave, the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Larry, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Beautiful. Before the post-communion prayer, there are, if, if, if you read the day-by-day -day devotionals, there's, there's the new ones are in the, in the back of the, uh, the entrance to the church on a little table. So if you need uh, one of the devotionals, they begin in February, which is tomorrow. And uh, there's two sizes. There's a small version and a large print version. So take what you need. If you have loved ones to give them to, that's fine. If you need more, please let, please let us know. But they're a wonderful, uh, wonderful piece. So let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you, as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Our blessing for this epiphany season. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. <laughs>